What's up, St. Philip family? It is a great weekend here at St. Philip Neary. We got some exciting news this weekend. But first, I want you to hear again the responsorial psalm from this Sunday. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. O God, you are my God whom I seek. For you my flesh pines and my soul thirsts like the earth parched, lifeless, without water. Thus I have gazed toward you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. For your kindness is a greater good than life. My lips shall glorify you. As with the riches of a banquet I sh my s shall my soul be satisfied, and with exultant lips my mouth shall praise you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God. This psalm is so important. It's the revelation of God, so divine revelation, but it comes from the depths of our hearts. As St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord my God, that every single human person has a heart that is thirsting for God, that is made for heaven, that is made for those infinite things of God, and we thirst until we can receive it. And in this place, in this church, the infinite, oop, there it is. <laughs> the infinite God is here. Jesus, truly present here. In the mass, when we're here at mass, heaven and earth come down, come together, and all of heaven is here. So I am here. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, my God, and I am satisfied. I have, I have a taste of heaven here. And my, even my God comes to myself in the Mass. So here is the place where we come, our thirsting souls get to drink from that which we so long for. And every human heart is made for this place and this God. And I actually got to experience this firsthand this week. So it was Thursday, adoration had just continued, or just uh, finished up, and I was staying in the church and praying my office. And all of a sudden, the doors of the church over there, three boys come into the church. And I was like, oh no, what's going on? And I had met these boys earlier in the week and they see me and they say, oh, Father Andrew. So they run over to me. And as they're running over, they go, they go like underneath the overhang there with the door. And as they come into the dome of the church, they go like this, whoa. They're like, whoa, whoa. They'd never been in a church before. They just, I mean, they, they'd ride their bikes around or whatever, they'd never been inside, and they're just like overwhelmed by this like place. And then they come over to me, and I greet them, and they start like looking around, and I just start telling them about Jesus, about how Jesus loves them, how Jesus is God, and he died for them to save them from their sins. And they were listening to everything. And they even had this moment, this beautiful moment. They, they were, one of them said, as soon as I po poked my head in the door, I felt different. The other one's like, I feel something right here. It feels, it's just this place. There's something about this place. And they were in amazement. And they felt the presence of something here or someone here. And I told them about that someone. And they even like looked at them around and they felt the need. They did this. I didn't tell them. They took their shoes off because they, there was something about this. Oh, this is a nice place. They took their shoes off. And then I brought them over to the tabernacle. And they knelt down. I taught them how to make the sign of the cross. I told them that Jesus was right there and he loves them. He knows their name. And he, he sees them right now. And they prayed. We prayed together. And as they left, one of the kids said, man, I'm so glad we live so close to this place so we can come and visit here. How awesome is it that we get to be here? And they ran out rejoicing, saying like something happened. I felt something. It was incredible. And then it's funny, I, I mentioned, so I, I told this story about these kids, these beautiful kids who were just like incredible, like just incredible. They showed up today and they actually ended up coming to the 11 o'clock mass. So it was, it, was, uh, it was a really amazing experience. But that all shows us that these kids who knew nothing, they'd never been in church before, they knew nothing about Jesus, they knew nothing about the Eucharist, they knew nothing about a church like environment or heaven being here, everything I just said in the beginning, but they felt it. They felt it. They sensed that there was something different here. They felt different here in this place. 
And I thought, wow, what, a, what an amazing gift. And you see, brothers and sisters, this is what Eucharistic excellence is all about. This is what, why we started in July, right? We started this campaign of focusing on Eucharistic excellence because what we want to do, heaven is here whether we realize it or not. Jesus is here whether I realize or acknowledge it or not. But those are invisible realities. And so what I need to do is I need to make those invisible realities visible by the way in which I worship by the way in which we have the church organized, by the way in which we do everything. And that's why we were focusing on Eucharistic excellence, because if we can be excellent in everything we do regarding the Eucharist, excellent in our worship, excellent in the mass, excellent in the way we comport ourselves in this church, it communicates and makes visible the invisible reality that heaven is here, that Jesus, my God is here and I'm thirsting for him. And here's the place where my soul can take a drink. So Eucharistic excellence is all about making visible that invisible reality that heaven is here, God is here, and this is the one for whom my soul is thirsting, every human heart. So I wanted to take this time this weekend to give a progress support. How have we been doing? What have we been doing to inculcate, to focus on Eucharistic excellence? And, and where are we going? So I want to just talk about a few elements. So first, the first thing we did for Eucharistic Excellence was we focused on the leaders of the liturgy. So the liturgical ministers. And we realized like they are the ones that have responded to the call of God to serve in a very particular way. And I told them that they actually, so heaven is here, all of heaven. So they actually stand in the place of the angels. They stand in the place of the angels, ministering to God, ministering to the people of God. And so I, I explain their roles in an angelic way. So first of all, we have the ushers, and they are the guardian angels of the sacred space. That they are the ones who greet us and bring us into that space, and they're the ones that preserve and protect that space. They order the space, and they keep the sacred silence. So I've told them, maintain and, and regulate that sacred silence, protect this space so that everyone who enters into this space can encounter Jesus Christ, who's longing to be with them, longing to speak to them, who's thirsting for them. And so they are guardians of the sacred space. And then we have our choir, the music ministers. They are the place of the angelic choirs of heaven, which the angelic choirs are constantly around the throne of God, singing Sanctus, 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 Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. So the, the, the angel choirs are around us. They're here, they're singing, they're worshiping, but I can't see them. And the choir makes it possible for me to hear them. And so the liturgical, the, the, the music ministers, you know, I was thinking about this. We've moved our choir to the back corner for acoustic reasons. So there's like kind of a shell effect so they can focus their sound. But also, you know, if you've ever been to some traditional churches or most churches, you know, designed for over the centuries, they either have the choir, which is in the choir loft in the back or behind the sanctuary with a screen. And that's, that's both for acoustics, but also so that the choir can be heard and not seen. So like I'm in mass, I'm in, and the heavenly choirs are just bursting from a place. I can't even see the choir. I can't see them, but the sound of heaven is bursting from this place that I cannot see, but I can hear that angelic voices are bursting from this place. And so they, they are responsible for that. And they are taking the place of those angel choirs, surrounding the throne of God and offering him heavenly worship. The lectors, the lectors, they proclaim the message. Angels are messengers and they're proclaiming the message. They're proclaiming the word of God. And so every lector, not only do they practice their reading, but they pray with their reading. Every single lector takes time as they prepare the week before to pray with the reading so that they allow that, that word of God to penetrate their heart, to change them. So that when they proclaim that word, it's a prayerful, and changed way of proclaiming with power the word of God to the hearts of the people here that are broken, that are burdened, that are suffering, that are so in need of comfort, so in need of a consoling word, and so in need of the promise that this life is not the end, but that heaven awaits us. So they pray with that word, proclaiming angel ministers, messengers, proclaiming the message of God, the word of God. 
we have our altar servers, which the altar servers even wear the albs, right? So they, they, they wear the liturgical attire that shows that there's, there's something angelic about them, that they are the angel ministers to the altar of God. They're ministering to the altar. And so we've made lots of changes with the altar servers to increase their reverence, Lots more bowing, we've got the prayer hands, we've got a little bit more procession. We have a little bit more like patience and reverence in the way in which they handle the sacred vessels. And I tell them, these are the vessels that hold God. This is the, this is the place. And so they hold them in even a more reverent way. And, and they're getting every one of these ministers, is, they're working on it and they're getting better every week. And so very proud of them. But they're the angel ministers to the altar of God. And then we have the extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. And these have the highest expectation, the highest standard, because they have the greatest responsibility that they literally hold God in their hands. They're holding and protecting the sacred, the precious blood, the precious body of our Lord, and distributing this body and blood to their brothers and sisters. And so the way in which they comport themselves, bowing before Jesus in the Eucharist, the way in which they distribute Holy Communion, not hasting, not hastily, not just throwing it around, but the body of Christ. It communicates. It makes visible that invisible reality. This is not bread. This is Jesus. This is my God for whom I am thirsting, who wants to commune with me. And you know, every single liturgical, every single Eucharistic minister spends at least one hour in adoration every week because Eucharistic devotion is what drew them into this responsibility and, it, and, and that, that time and that commitment, adoring the Lord, being in his presence, helps them to stay connected with the mystery that they are serving. So that's the first thing we did. We've been focusing and training the liturgical ministers to be more and more excellent in making visible heaven, that the heaven is here, and especially the reverence for God in the Eucharist, that Jesus is present here. And I, I've, we've, we've talked at length about how everything they do either communicates that reality or detracts from it. So I'm very grateful for our liturgical ministers for taking the challenge up and for being so flexible and for every week improving. And it's, it's just been incredible. So thank you, liturgical ministers. So that's been the first part. And they're gonna continue to grow. We're gonna continue to work and we're gonna continue to add to the ranks because we do need other ministers to take on the ranks um, and to continue serving us. The next thing we did was we've been experimenting with our music. So you've noticed that there's a change in music. We have James Rosenblum now, an incredible director uh, who took over after Patty Neal, an incredible director as well. And so this transition, we, we're, we focused on this Eucharistic excellence. So how can we, as music, how can we instruct hearts, teaching hearts, how to enter into the mystery? How can we move hearts through the mass prayerfully and so we've been experimenting with certain, you know, a little bit of different hymns, chant, some Latin, and I want to talk about those things. So first of all, the hymns that some of them have been new to us, the hymns that we've been selecting, we try to be very connected to the word of God that's proclaimed at that mass. That each mass, we know, has different readings. Each mass actually has, a different, has different prayers and a different theme. So every mass, we're praying for something unique and different. And so the music can teach my heart more about that particular mystery that's being celebrated, that particular thing that heaven is rejoicing over at that mass. So we've been trying to select hymns that connect to the word, that connect to the mass. Secondly, with chant, I think chant, chant's really interesting. Um, so when do you chant? The answer is probably never, right? We never, unless we're like joking about pretending to be a monk or uh, we're, we're doing Monty Python and and we hit that. So if, unless we're like joking around, we never chant. We sing all the time or try to sing, especially when no one's around, right? Or in the shower, like we will rock out. Okay, so we will sing our hearts out. Uh, all the time in different areas. And we sing at church too, because it's important to celebrate, to rejoice. But we only chant here. It's different. It's making visible, making audible, that there's something different here than anywhere else in my life. That this is something that, this is a ritual. 
This is something that I do when I'm in heaven. This is something that I do when I pray in the mass. Not other times, but usually but when I'm here in the liturgy, that when heaven is present in a real way, I chant. And chant lends itself to more reflective and prayerful, like it guides our hearts in a prayerful, reflective way so I can keep my heart engaged. And it's very focused on the text. So the, so the, so the words that are being chanted are important. And so that's why we're trying to incorporate a little bit more chant because it's something different. It's something transcendent. It's something ritualistic that reminds me that heaven is here, the heaven that my heart is thirsting for. And also the, we've in, we introduced some Latin and even some, some Greek, right? The Kyrie uh, Eleison. So we've introduced some Latin, some more Latin. And I wanna talk about Latin for a second too. So first of all, the saints, the saint, our patron, Philip Neri, he prayed in Latin. So from his lips, the words that we get to pray in the mass, Agnus Dei, Sanctus, 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 these are words and songs that he would have sung with his lips, our patron. And for 2,000 years, the saints of the church were sanctified through praying in Latin. And the church all throughout the world prays in Latin. So it's this universal, it unites us as brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, like in the Latin rite. So we are speaking this language of the church, connecting us. The second thing I wanna say about Latin is this. So sometimes people are, they don't like Latin because they feel that they don't understand, right? So we don't understand, why are we speaking a language that we don't understand? I, you know, I love the mass and I love that I can speak in my vernacular and I can understand the words that I'm saying. But when I speak Latin, I can't understand it. This is a, a dead language. Here's what I'd ask. If I can understand everything about God, he's not God. You see, God is infinitely greater than my understanding. If I have, could reduce God to my box and like what I understand and how I understand me and my Jesus, if I could reduce him to that, I've reduced him to a human thing. And thank you, God, that you are not human. Yes, Jesus, human, but divine. So he's imminent, right? Relatable, absolutely. But also infinitely greater than my capacity to ever comprehend or understand. That's God infinitely beyond my understanding. And so what ritual does, what mystery does, mystery is infinite depth. So there should be times in the mass where I'm just caught up in the mystery. I'm caught up in the ritual that I'm actually, there are times, I hope there are times where I'm like, I don't fully understand this. As St. Aqu Thomas Aquinas, he says, he says, sensum fetum defectui, praesit fetus supplementum, sensum, sensus fetum defectui. Try, try Latin here, <laughs> right? When my senses fail, let faith supply. Like when I can't understand or even comprehend what's going on, that this is not bread, that this is Jesus. There are so many things in this ritual that should blow my mind and so beyond me that it allows me to see I am part of a God has taken me that's so bigger than me and so bigger than my problems, so infinitely beyond my understanding. I'm made for ritual. I'm made for mystery. And so there should be moments where I don't understand, but I'm just in it. And that's a gift. It's not a, it's not a burden. It's a gift. So that's what Latin can kind of do. And so we, we've been trying those different things, uh, with the music and we are, it's a work in progress. We're trying to understand and we want this to be a beautiful, the most excellent celebration we can, we can make. And so we're working in that direction. The third thing that we've been working on, which I'm super excited about is beautification of the sacred space. So we've done a few things where we painted, added some, some beautiful art and, you know, but I want to take you through this little progress that will lead us to something really amazing that's happening right now. So take you back, Fam Jam 2022, huge success, amazing success. It was a, such a great turnout. People were so generous and we were able to take the proceeds from that beautiful family event and do incredible things. So we, we replaced some floors in the school. We put signage all around, you saw in, in the gym and in, on, the, on the school building. We were able to do so much on the school campus and we paved and painted the parking lot so that it can be safe and people know where to go and you can park in the spaces and you can know, hey, this is a, this is a crosswalk. It's not a parking space, right? <laughs> so we have this beautiful paved parking lot thanks to Fam Jam 2022. 
The gardening club has been doing an amazing job of maintaining and beautifying those gardens. Thank you, gardening club. They really look amazing. Those flowers have been lasting through the heat and through the summer. And it's it just, we're so grateful because it just looks so amazing. So the gardens are looking beautiful. Fam Jam 2023 this year was a huge success again, even blew the proceeds out of the water from last year. We don't know the exact number, but we can safely say over 120K was brought in by your generosity and by this incredible family event and the money that's gonna go to some incredible projects in the school and on our campus. And in particular, on the church side of things, you might notice we are very Franciscan in that we have uh, housed many animals, so cats and possums and those things, because you can see directly under the church and through the church because the subsidence is terrible. So I am, we're working on some different companies and we're about to land on a bid to completely redo the soap surface drainage, to, to level everything out so that the subsidence issue can be remedied, the sidewalks and everything can be supported so that we have a sure foundation and we're really caring for that space by redoing all that drainage. So thank you, Fam Jam 2023, because you're gonna provide for that. As well, when we walk into the church, Father Harry knew that the climate control in the church was on its last leg like 10 years ago. So he had been kind of squirreling away funds, knowing that at some point in the near future, we'd need to make some replacements within the AC and the, the HVAC in, this, in the church. And so that time has come upon us and, um, and I know this summer was tough because we had like two blowers working at some points. And then, you know, now it's like, it's too cold, it's too hot. So we are, we have bids out for that too, to, to replace and to restore the climate control in the church, um, thanks to Father Harry's foresight. And so we got all these things that are working on to get the practical needs. But this is what I really, really am excited about sharing with you. So right now, and for the past few months, we, there's an art society called St. Louis the Ninth Art Society an incredible society in New Orleans here, local group. And they are working, architects and sacred artists, they're working on a plan for us to do some really cool beautification work. So the first thing that they're working on actually is, drum roll, brrr, more bathrooms <laughs> and not bathrooms behind Jesus. So Jesus doesn't have to hear the flushing uh, throughout the mass and there people don't have to line up next to the tabernacle. So we're gonna have more bathrooms in a different area. It's gonna be so great. And we won't have to deal with, we don't have to go behind Jesus to use the restroom and, and, just, and, and just that, oh, poor Jesus, right? Poor Jesus. So they're working on new bathrooms. So that should be, hopefully you guys are making a lot of applause. Uh, so excited for this new opportunity, you know, for, especially for the, you families with the young children, we're looking out for you. So they're designing bathrooms. And so I wanted to paint that picture first to let you know all these practical needs are being addressed so that we can do what we really, really are excited about doing. And that is, right now, there are sacred artists, incredible artists. You can see their work on the on St. Louis the Ninth website. Incredible artists that are working on designing, painting heaven on our ceiling. Whoa. Can you imagine walking into our church, this beautiful blank canvas, walking in and seeing heaven bursting from the ceiling. The invisible reality that heaven is here, made visible by the work of these artists. That's where we're working towards. And that's the whole point, this Eucharistic excellence. We're building and trying to make visible this invisible reality of heaven. Make visible the invisible reality that God is here so that people come in, the thirsting hearts can come into here and they can experience God and experience heaven, just like those three little boys. And isn't it amazing that we get to be here now, that Jesus has called us together right now to be a part of this transformation. We've had such a history of an incredible parish, incredible pastors, incredible leadership, incredible parishioners, building and building and building. And this is the time that he's called us to be here when there's this just flowering, this fruitfulness that's been won from the suffering and prayers of these decades of our parish life. We get to be here now. And so the question is this, how can I be a part of this? See, it's, it's not just me, it's not just what we're doing, you know, generally in the parish. Each one of us has a part to play. Each one of us is, a, is on for the ride. We're on this train being driven and led by Jesus Christ. So the question I want each of us to ask, you and me, 
How can I participate in this transformation? The first thing that each of you can do is this. Each of us needs to ask this question. How can I be most excellent for Jesus, especially when I'm here at the Mass? How can I live Eucharistic excellence myself personally? Because you see, I am a visible sign of an invisible reality. The way in which I worship, the way in which I acknowledge Jesus, the way in which I speak, the way in which I pray, the way in which I orient myself in the Mass, it communicates that heaven is here, it communicates that Jesus is here, or it can be do the opposite. So each one of us can be a visible sign of heaven and Jesus present in the Eucharist. So how can I be most excellent? A few points on that. One, the way in which I walk into church. Jesus has been thirsting for me from all eternity, and I've been thirsting for him all week. So in entering the church, I maintain a sacred silence a reverent silence. I come to my pew, I sit down or I kneel down and I speak to Jesus and listen as he speaks to my heart, as my soul takes in that which it is thirsting for. God himself truly here loving me. So maintaining sacred silence when I enter the church, not having these conversations before mass to truly enter in. And I've asked the ushers to kind of keep that quiet, guardians of the sacred space. So the way I enter church and, and enter into prayer, it communicates Jesus is here and it sets an example for all those around me. While I'm at Mass, I participate. I respond, especially engaging with my heart. That's the most important participation, is actually giving my heart to the Mass, aligning my heart with the prayer, singing if I can, and if I can't, try my best, right? To, to, to give myself to the Lord, to participate to the best of my ability, but most of all, to participate with my heart. What I wear to Mass, my attire, it communicates something. You see, sometimes people will say, you know, well, God doesn't care, or God accepts me as I am. He takes me as I am. And I'm like, yes, he does. He loves us, and he completely accepts us as we are. And he, he, he does not, like, that's not on, his, on his, his, his radar necessarily. You know, everything's on his radar. But like, yeah, okay, God might not care, but I should. I care. This is the one for whom my heart was made. This is the one who created me. This is the one who brought me into existence. This is the one who I want to be with for all eternity. This is the one that my soul is thirsting for. And so there's no more important meeting. There's no more important place than being here and being in heaven and in my thirsting soul being like drinking deeply. So what I wear communicates the importance of this event. The way I wear communicates the importance of the person that I'm going to see. I'm coming to see the king. And so when I wear something nice, it communicates to those around me, hey, there's something here. There's something special here. There's something worth preparing for here. There's something here that I can't get anywhere else. So, that, so what I wear communicates excellence, not because of what God is asking of me, but because of what I want to give to God to show him my excellence, my devotion, my love. And also another thing that we can do is to wait. To wait until Jesus leads us out into the world. To wait until Jesus, meaning the, like the, so that when the priest processes out and goes out those doors, opening those doors, he leads us, the good shepherd leads us into the world so that we can take Jesus, go, it is sent, get out of here and go into the world and bring Jesus into the world. Bring heaven, bring Jesus that you've just received into the world and Jesus leads us out there. So remain here until the priest leaves these are just some few points that can really, really transform our, our, the whole experience for all of us at this Mass, communicating to everyone that enters this church that there's something special here, that heaven's here, God is here, and it's worth my time to be here. It's actually the most important use of my time in my entire week. The second thing that I, I ask everyone to do is just, just open your heart to Jesus open your heart to Jesus. Open your heart to ask, Jesus, how are you inviting me to participate in this transformation? How are you inviting me to play a special role, to use my time, my talent, my treasure? How are you inviting me into this in a unique way to help with this transformation? Because each of us have particular gifts, gifts and a particular way Jesus is gonna invite us, so open your heart to that. So be excellent 
and open the heart to what Jesus is calling. I conclude with this. Oh, that's the bell. <laughs> I conclude with this. In two weeks, we're going to have the celebration of Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe. This is the last Sunday in the liturgical year. And what we're doing is we're gonna have a huge Eucharistic procession following the 11 o'clock mass. And I want everyone to be there. This is the moment where we have, we've been working on this excellence individually and, and as a parish, we've been working on this excellence and we are letting Jesus Christ lead the way. So we're gonna take Jesus, literally take Jesus through every area of our campus, through the school, through the buildings, through the, the yard, through this whole place to say, Jesus, you are our King. Jesus, you are the Lord. Jesus, you are King of the universe and you're the King of our hearts. And we give this whole thing to you. This is your mission. This is your parish. This is your transformation. And we are so excited to be a part of it. And so we're subjecting ourselves, submitting ourselves, falling down at the feet of our Lord and letting him lead us wherever he wants us to go. And I'm not sure where exactly we're going, but I do know that eventually he's leading us to heaven. And what we are doing here is making heaven visible, making the invisible reality of that one thing, heaven and my Lord God, that my heart is thirsting for, making that visible so that everyone who enters into this church, even if they are the three little boys who've never been in a church before, they come in here and they say, there's something different about this place. I can feel it, I can taste it. It's that thing that my soul has been thirsting for my entire life.